So this course is offered by Professor Anur Mutlu and I'm Mohammed Alsar. So I'm happy to have all of you here in this course. And um, so let's talk a little bit about the role of this course. And um, you're already aware about the description of the course. So this is just copy paste from the website. Um, actually, we will cover in this course the basics of genome analysis. We won't teach you genome analysis, but we will cover the things that you might need uh, for the projects that you would like to carry out. And these things will enable you to understand the computational uh, steps of the entire pipeline of genome analysis. And after understanding these steps, you will analyze them, you will profile them such that you will find some bottlenecks, computational bottlenecks. So we already have done a lot of research in this area and we identify many of these computational steps. So that will help you to get insights about um, which step you should start with, but we might need your help uh, to profile and do a thorough analysis to certain uh, pipeline or certain steps. And then you will figure out yourself that this is a bottleneck. This is a real bottleneck that you need to accelerate. So by this course, uh, students will learn about the existing efforts for accelerating one or more of these steps. So we already assigned some of the learning materials, especially the first and the second uh, materials. Uh, the first one is a lecture uh, uh, given by Professor Anur Mutlu about um, the uh, introduction to genome analysis to provide a lot of research uh, efforts about uh, how we accelerate or improve the performance or the algorithm. And the second material is very important, especially for this course where you are aiming to accelerate uh, one or more steps in genome analysis and to provide the survey that we, um, that we uh, performed in our group to figure out exactly what are the efforts for every single step of uh, read mapping, uh, which is a key step in genome analysis. So it's very important to study these uh, learning materials. And I cannot emphasize it much, but I will keep repeating this in every, almost every couple of slides. You have to study these materials before the next week. So, um, after having a good base of knowledge, then you will start carrying out a hands-on project to implement and improve these acceleration efforts. So don't think about uh, building something really huge or changing the way we analyze our genomes and so on, but think about it as a small FPGA project that where you need to implement first an FPGA, then after implementing yourself existing uh, approach, then you will find out some inefficiencies here and there with the help of the supervisors. Then you need to tweak that uh, change or adapt to a new algorithm, a new approach, then that's it. So don't worry that much about the project. It will be so much interesting, learning new things about genome analysis, the things that we are facing in the pandemic time about COVID-19 and maybe other disease. So it's, it's very useful to help the society by building these accelerators and use them in real life. So what are the things um, or the objectives of this, uh, of this course? So there are multiple components that are aimed at improving students' basic knowledge in genome analysis. And when I say genome analysis, don't think about wet labs or the things you see in hospitals or uh, laboratories. So these normally we call them wet lab, but what we are talking about or what we consider here is the computational steps, the things that we uh, use in algorithms, run them in CPUs, then have some GPU accelerator to run them, run them much faster or more efficient than a typical CPU. And what we call this, we call it a dry lab. So after having uh, analyzing your blood in the lab, they provide us a text file that has the content of your genome. Then our job is to analyze these text files so we don't deal with blood samples or all this stuff. And the, the course will also help you to gain more technical skills in genome analysis and computer architecture. Since you will combine both skills, so it will be a very unique opportunity for you to uh, apply the knowledge that you have in GPUs and Verilog and C programming with something that is really beneficial in our life. And it will help you to gain more critical thinking 
especially when you face a problem uh, while you are implementing or designing, then we will teach you what's the best way to address that problem, how you can find similar solution to existing problems using literature review or um, asking experts in this field and so on. You will also be very familiar with key research directions, especially that in our own research group, uh, which is called a Safari Research Group, led by Professor Onur Mutlu, we are already working on the things that we are assigning to you. So these projects are really hot research uh, topics these days. And by addressing one of them or improving one of them, you are already ready to go for master's or PhD degree or even uh, something um, else related to industry where you do research and development or so any, um, any project you know, that you'd like to accelerate and hardware accelerators, for example. And towards the end of the projects, you will present your project. And before presentation, we need to make sure that you are ready for the presentation such that we will give you a lot of comments, um, how to improve your slides, how to improve uh, presenting actually the, the, the project itself. And that will help you to gain more technical presentation skills. Um, uh, and um, we will also, based on your progress, we are going to help you to publish it in a conference or a journal. And we'll give you details in the next slide. So uh, what is the key goal of this course? Basically, uh, we will teach you how to efficiently accelerate one of the key steps in genome analysis as simple as this, but it's, it, it might be more challenging as it sounds. So um, we already, do, uh, we are doing, especially myself and my colleague, uh, which are attending uh, this meeting, they, they're already accelerating some of these steps and they have published very good papers and good venues about uh, these uh, steps and these efforts. So we can really teach you how to do the things in a more efficient way, but you will have to do uh, your job in implementing, designing, and improving the things, maybe suggesting ideas and so on. Right, so what are the prerequisites of the course? Um, actually, we don't require anything related to bioinformatics, genome analysis, or biology, or whatever related courses. Uh, because we are going to teach you actually what you really need uh, for um, uh, carrying out uh, the, the, the projects that uh, we will assign to you. But uh, we cannot teach you digital design, for example, or computer architecture. And um, it's very important that you already took these courses before. Uh, it's okay if the syllabus are different from what Professor Honor Mutlu offered in his courses, that's fine, but at least you already know the basics about FPGAs, CPUs, uh, GPUs. You don't know to learn all of these because at the end you will pick one platform to program. And you could program um, a GPU with a C language, right? This is normal what we use or different languages based on the um, simulator or the framework you use. So um, there are some differences with CUDA programming, but yeah, we can tolerate these things if you never learn how to program GPUs. Let's see how it uh, goes with the project, but at least you are capable of programming in C, let's say. And even if you don't know C and you know, for example, similar other languages, it's easy to adapt yourself to different programming languages if you know the basics, the concepts, how to use the syntax and so on. We require an experience in one of these, FPGA implementation or GPU programming. SIMD acceleration also can be an option, um, but normally I prefer to have a FPGA implementation or GPU, actually. But if you have any concern about this, any um, doubts, maybe you can email us and we can see if we can match uh, your interests, your skills, background to uh, the projects that we have. Of course, uh, this thing is not straightforward. It doesn't sound like you write a C program, then you compile it, run it, and that's it. Everything very nice, smooth, there is no problem. That's why you should have um, really skills in managing uh, problems, how you search in Google, finding a solution, or reading more papers to find, to find relevant uh, solution to existing problems and so on. So you can think about it as if you have a course, 
project, but uh, you have more time to do more uh, contribution to that project. Because we will have less teaching, we will keep teaching you and the things that you need for the project, actually. There is no specific or fixed schedule for curriculum and such, but rather we will have a meeting with you, check your progress with the project, and if you need more uh, ideas, more things and uh, knowledge about the step you are doing, we will keep teaching you until you get good knowledge, then you continue with that and so on. But we will have very regular meetings um, for, I think it should be individual meetings, one-to-one -one with you and uh, one or two supervisors actually. All right, so as I mentioned, this course is offered by Professor Honor Mutlu, who's a professor at ETH since uh, around five years. And he was a professor at CMU for about seven years. He already worked in the industry in several high profile companies. And we still have a very good relationship with uh, most of these. They provide us funding and so on. And uh, the best way to contact uh, Professor Honor Mutlu is uh, his Gmail address, this one. So feel free to contact him or any one of us. Uh, our email address is already on the course web page, which I will mention in the next few slides. So again, uh, what we are doing, uh, we are in Safari Research Group, um, and um, we are doing a lot of things. Um, very different things. It can be from computer architecture, computer systems, hardware security, and bioinformatics, uh, building um, or improving, characterizing the memory system, uh, the caches, the storage systems, doing accelerator at different stack level, and building um, hardware software co-design for bioinformatics, health med, uh, applications, and so on. Okay, so um, I'm the lead supervisor and we have a good number of uh, supervisors. Uh, so in total, we are four supervisors and we have four students. So that is a good deal. We will keep uh, extending the list of supervisors based on the projects that we assign to you. So we will have also, um, so uh, Dr. Juan, uh, Luna, Jeremy and John. Jeremy and John are PhD student with Safari Group. And um, we have also Damla here, one of the attendee, I think. Yes, she's here. Uh, we might also have Nika. So all of these, you can find the names in Safari Research Groups, more details about research interests, the things that they are doing, and what research paper they have been publishing uh, so far, and so on. So it's very important to get yourself familiar with everyone in the group, and especially these supervisors. That will help you a lot to select uh, the project. We are going to um, give you a list of potential projects next week. And uh, we will explain to you every project, what's about, what we expect, and the skills required for that project. And we cover different skills, actually, with the list. It's very comprehensive. We have different projects, totally different steps in the genome analysis. And uh, I hope by that we cover different interests um, from four of you. We will discuss it next week, actually. But it's very important to get uh, familiar with all these names, research interests, before the next week. Okay, what do we expect from you? Um, attendance, it's very important uh, to these meetings, such as today, and to the other meetings where we have one-to-one -one meetings between you and the supervisors. It's all about the, your project. So you should care about it. It's very important such that you can do a good progress and complete the project by the end of the semester. Um, we give you already the, help, the first homework, which is studying the learning materials. Um, we give you two as compulsory materials. Um, the first one is the lecture given by Professor Honor Mutlu, and the second one is the survey and then pick two papers out of three papers as optional uh, choice. So most of them, they already have videos about uh, the paper, about the discussion. So it might be easier for you to watch the video first, then maybe you can skim the paper or read it in details, it's up to you. But it's very important to finish all of these learning materials before the next week. Um, 
as, as we are going to teach you some of the concepts in genome analysis and how you can accelerate them, we expect you to carry out a hands-on project. You need to build, implement, do coding, design some stuff in FPGA or some other architectures in memory and so on. All of this with a close engagement and help from the supervisors. You might have one or two supervisors for each project. And again, they are already expert in the field. They already have um, uh, been doing many acceleration stuff for other steps in genome analysis. You can check their paper. So that will help you a lot. And we expect you to ask questions, to be very active in all discussions, to contribute to thoughts, ideas. Um, maybe you can suggest new papers that the supervisors are not aware of. It's very recent or something very related to the things that you are doing. Maybe you find that what you are doing has already been implemented before, but in different ways. So you might uh, to try different algorithm, different architecture before you uh, proceed or you uh, implement the things that you have in mind. Of course, to do all of this, you need to read relevant papers. And um, Professor Honor Mutlu promised if you do a good progress in your projects, we are going to help you a lot to get these projects published in good venues. That uh, means uh, good conferences or good or good uh, journals. So it might be in bioinformatics or computer architecture. It will help you in writing and submission and follow up even after uh, you finish the course. So we might continue doing your project and you still be involved. But what we need from your side is good progress throughout the next three, uh, three months. And uh, as I sent you the email yesterday, um, this is the uh, link for the, um, for uh, I think Sunday I sent the email. This is the link to the course webpage. We will try to update it, keep it uh, up to date for all information needed about the course, the slides, the things I'm presenting today and uh, other matters maybe. And for that, um, you need to check your email frequently for the announcements. And we will have Piazza uh, soon for this course where you can ask questions to everyone, to the supervisors, to the other students. And we will post announcement as well there. So maybe it's a much easier platform than email where we can lose the track of who sent who and you might send to the supervisor, but the other student don't know what you're talking about and so on. So we will keep using email and Piazza together. I'll send you the details uh, once I created uh, the Piazza for the course. All right, so that's all for this meeting this week. Uh, we will have the next week um, exactly as of today. So next Tuesday, we will meet again. Uh, I would suggest the same time if it's good for everyone. So we can meet at 6.30 uh, next Tuesday. Is it good? Uh, for me, it's Tuesday is a really bad day. So if another day would be possible, I would really appreciate that. Okay, no problem. Uh, do you have suggestions? Uh, not Tuesday and not Wednesday. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm free, not Wednesday. more or less, if it is evening. How about other students? Uh, I can't make it on Monday. That's the only day I can. Really Mon get. You can't make it, right? Yeah, I can't make it on Monday. I see. Uh, for so me, I'm not sure yet, though, but uh, I think I can adapt. Okay, very Otherwise, good. I will definitely tell you if I can't, <laughs> so. I see, yeah. So we have so far Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, no. And first day will be fine for me. Sorry? I, I will manage first day, so. First day. It's, it's all right. I, I don't really care which day, to be honest. Okay, I see. So, yeah, probably I will choose Thursday or Friday, actually. It depends on the supervisors as well, because they are going to explain about the projects next week. So we will discuss this internally and then see with you whether the time is good or not. But do you prefer afternoon or morning? Morning. Morning, okay. Well, I <laughs> uh, Thursday morning, I would have a lecture. 
<laughs> I could uh, Wednesday morning, but uh, Thursday only afternoon. I afternoon see. or even. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Maybe the best thing is to have a doodle and uh, see what is the best time for everyone. Yeah, we will send you email and details about this. But yeah, be ready that we will meet next week again. Um, we will announce the projects that we have in the description for each project, what we expect from your side, what are the needed skills and so on. Uh, we will give you a chance after announcing this uh, list of projects to select or to give to provide your preferences to one to three projects. So after choosing one to three projects, could be two projects, three, five, and then we will meet again. But this time will be one to one meeting during maybe the same week, which is next week. And we'll try to match your interests, skills, and background with the projects that you prefer. So as we know maybe better than you, what are these uh, courses about? So we can give you a good uh, insights about um, whether this is a good fit for your expertise or not. So it's important that you study the learning materials before our next meeting. So maybe this is the third time I mention it, but it's very important to do so. Okay, so that's all for the logistics of the course. Uh, Cannot see the time here. Yeah, there is no. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, we have um, 20 minutes. Oh, yeah, we have 30 minutes. Okay, cool. You still can see the screen, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Do you have any questions about the logistics before I start a uh, brief introduction to genome analysis? Okay. Although we assign uh, these lectures a similar content uh, in the uh, learning materials, but I would like to help you and uh, give you just a brief introduction to what is genome analysis actually. So before you start studying the materials, you are already introduced to these concepts. Okay, so in, in, in brief, in short, genome analysis is just to read um, the complete sequence of your genome and then start comparing it with other genomes such that you know the differences that cause a disease or a phenotype. And what are these ACGTs? These are normally chemical molecules. So if you study biology in school or somewhere else, then you already know that your DNA is composed of these four chemical molecules, which are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. And um, these exist in all your cells, regardless what's the functionality of that cell. It could be heart cell, a leg cell, a lung cell, and so on. All of them has, uh, have exactly the same content of the DNA. But what is different is the way they are converted into protein. So this uh, DNA is converted into something else, then to some other th things. Then at the end, these things will be translated into phenotypes that you observe, which is eye color, hair color, skin color, and so on. Unfortunately, we don't have until this day any machine that can take a blood sample or any genetic sample and provide you the full sequence of DNA. So this is very difficult for us to start comparing the DNA. And to do that, uh, there, is, there was a huge project in the past, which was called the Human Genome Project. And it took us 13 years to, um, to release the first draft of the human genome, which is 3.2 billion characters of these ACGTs. And cost the, uh, the governments were involved in that time about $3 billion. So every single character and the human genome cost the government about $1. Every single character, 
So it's a really expensive process, 13 years just to know single human genome and uh, consider it as a reference in that time where we were not able to know what's inside the genomes before. However, in these days, uh, we have the things improved um, more significantly. So we are able to read the content of your genome and in, in a very fast way, in a very uh, cost efficient way. So to just analyze or to get the content of, a hu of your genome, it might cost you less than $1,000, depends on the technology they use. And it can be ready in about 44 hours to one week, probably. But the problem with that, you don't get the full sequence of your DNA. What you get is subsequences of your DNA. So if your DNA is 3 billion characters, what you will get is a bunch of 100 long subsequences or million long subsequences. Regardless of these numbers, what at the end what you will get is subsequences of your DNA. So this is a carton uh, figure for the uh, pipeline we have. You have the blood sample or the genomic sample. You send it to a wet lab. It could be laboratory, it could be hospital, it could be anything. And these they have a machine what we call a sequencer. The sequencer converts the chemical molecules into a text format, which is the things that you get as a result, which, uh, which are the, 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 the subsequences of your genome. So since they are subsequences, uh, they are useless as they are. So they are raw data. There is no information carrying on. You can know nothing about disease or about uh, whether you may have this disease or not unless you uh, concatenate all these subsequences together and build back your full sequence of DNA. Because you don't know whether this piece um, represents chromosome one, for example, or a region that a disease might affect. So you need to really build back the full uh, sequence of 3.2 billion characters and then you can compare it with another healthy genome or let's say another genome because the, the genomic differences might not necessarily lead to a disease, but might lead to different phenotype. For example, skin color, color. we don't consider it as disease or eye color or hair color and so on. And there are some differences that may not lead to something that we know. The typical healthy person, for example. And there are some differences as well, might lead to problems in the next generations, not in the current generations. So all of these we would like to figure out after we build the complete sequence of these individuals. And that what we call a read mapping steps. So as it sounds, read mapping, so you'd like to map these subsequences. Each subsequence, we call it a read, and you'd like to map them to something that we know, which um, which is the reference genome, the things I presented in the previous slides that took us 13 years to build. That is what we consider as a reference genome. And whenever we get a read, we keep comparing it to a reference genome. If it is similar to a certain region, then we say, okay, with high probability, maybe that read is generated from that region. So I'm going to stick it there. So this is exactly what we do in puzzle. When you solve the puzzle, you have an image or a picture, right? For the things after uh, you connect them together, these, all these puzzle pieces. So this picture is the reference for you. And you keep comparing the, the shape or the color or the picture on the uh, puzzle pieces. And if it match a region in the reference or the picture, then you said, okay, this piece might coming from that region. This is exactly what we are doing and read mapping. These are different machines uh, that we call sequencers. They might be very small, they might be very large. So this one is fridge size, for example, it's really huge, but this one is less than the hand. This one is even uh, smaller and can be connected to a mobile device, for example. And all these devices, they are different in the output. So they might generate high throughput, low throughput, maybe sequencing errors, less or more, maybe a shorter subsequences, longer subsequences, and so on. All of them are still used. Uh, maybe this device uh, or 
No, I think all of them are recent and updated. Yeah, I think all of these devices are used for different applications. Sometimes you don't need to uh, sequence too much. Sometimes uh, you have application specific sequencing. Sometimes you don't care about the errors you have. Sometimes you worry about the errors. So you need um, a more expensive uh, machine to provide accurate reads. But uh, the problem with accurate reads is that they are always short and so on. So it's very challenging. It's not like you have a unique output that you can analyze. There are totally different characteristics uh, uh, out of these uh, devices. But what is common between all these devices is that the output that they provide lack any information about their order or location. So none of these pieces tell you that this piece or I am coming from this region or that region or I am from chromosome one location 100, for example. No, none of them. So it's very difficult for you to get just strings and then try to figure out they are coming from which page in a book. It's very challenging. You need to search all the entire book to figure out that this word might come from that page. And it will be more challenging if that word occur, um, occurs more frequently in different pages then you cannot figure out which exact page uh, has that word. So uh, this is a very nice example from Jan Fertina on uh, the long and short reads. So we have Jan here as one of the supervisors. And um, that will tell you the challenges you might have when you deal with short or long reads. So exactly the same thing with the puzzle. So in puzzle, you might have 16 pieces or you might have 1 million pieces uh, uh, for a single puzzle. So which is more challenging um, when you try to solve this puzzle? Having um, a huge number of pieces, but they are very small or large, uh, large pieces. So uh, definitely having large pieces might um, help you to solve the puzzle much faster because you can easily match the puzzle pieces to the reference or to the picture. But the problem with uh, um, read sequencing or genome sequencing is that the short are accurate, but the long pieces are inaccurate. So these machines, uh, as any other machine, they are not perfect. So the, uh, this imperfection imposes uh, sequencing errors in the read. These, um, they still have uh, errors, but the error rate is really very low, less than 0 0.001. But in these large pieces, we have up to 15 to 20% of them are errors. With these errors, we cannot say if this individual uh, has that disease or not, because uh, the, these differences in genomes might come from the sequencing errors and not from the phenotype or the genotype uh, an individual has. I have a short question. Yes, please go ahead. Um, is that the error rate per piece or per base pair? That is per um, base pair. But you can consider it per piece because it's really random. So when you run the, uh, the, the, the read again or the same sample again, you might not get the same pieces. Okay. It's okay. totally random. But we cannot still say which technology is better. Which one? To use short or long reads better. Both of them are still used, and sometimes we are even used uh, both of them together in the same application as a hybrid approach, because these are uh, accurate but short, and these are long but uh, inaccurate. So they complement each other. When you combine them, you get more powerful approach, but it's expensive because you need to sequence uh, your sample twice, and every time you pay $1,000 or so for, se for sequencing. So as a bioinformatician or a computer scientist or electric engineer, your goal is actually to stick these pieces of the vase together, actually, to build back your genome. So this is a very simple example, can help you a lot to understand the things. Okay, 
So now, this is an ideal example where you already know what's the source of these reads. So if someone already know that I pick a blood sample that is a very clear sample, very clean, uh, and belongs to a single species, then when I convert it into reads, so this is a chemical format, which is the raw DNA. And when I send it to the, um, the sequencer, then I get a bunch of reads from the sequencer which is in text format that I can process in uh, today's computer. Now, since I know the source was uh, a human, so I get the reference of the human being and then start to match uh, every piece to that reference genome. So I pick one piece, I check the location here, and I think, I said, okay, here, this location might be a good match because there is high similarity between this piece and this region. Then I do the same thing for all these pieces. After I get all these pieces matched to the reference, which you can think as a puzzle, then I look to the picture, the full picture of this puzzle. Does it match the, the reference I have? If, if so, then okay, I have a complete, nice, a smooth a sequence of uh, my DNA bases, then okay, now I have the DNA, I can easily compare it other genomes such that finding differences between them. However, this is very ideal scenario. In real life, when you pick a sample from human being or from anything, could be the train, the flight seats, the, the schools, benches, or anything. Normally, when I collect a sample, I swap it to a place where many microbiome might be there. It can be viruses, germs, bacteria, it can be anything, or even human traces, more than a single individual. For that, when I sequence the sample, I get reads from too many species that I may know and I may don't know. For example, the coronavirus in the early time, we didn't know anything about it. We don't know the reference, for example. So it will be very challenging for the guy who's responsible for genome analysis to pick the references. Which references should I pick? Is it a human? Is it bacteria, virus? Which virus exactly? Which bacteria? Which a human? So it's very difficult for us to decide. And normally we have a huge database of all existing references, and we start comparing all these reads one by one to each reference in the database we have. So we can have all known references for humans, all known references for bacteria, for viruses, and so on. The problem with that, exactly with the example of book. So when you have a short word and you try to match it with a complete book, then it's very hard to find the exact page because it might uh, already appear in several pages. Same thing here. Each read might appear in several references. It can come from human, from bacteria, and so on. So that impose new algorithms and new restrictions and new computational steps that are required to figure out how we can break the ties between these references. Should I say that, okay, in my sample, I have this reference and this bacteria and this virus. So it will be very hard if I figure out that I find something dangerous, a virus, for example, that uh, caused death or something else. Okay, and this steps, the things that I were explaining, what we call read mapping, as I mentioned. And it's very challenging because again, a read might match to different locations. So I need to report many, many locations actually for each read. The same read might fit here, might fit there and so on. So um, to explain this figure actually, you can consider this, the first line is the reference genome. And all these short pieces here down are the reads. So this is a read, this is a read, this is large read, this is another long reads and so on. So the same read might fit to different locations because the human genomes, so this is an aside uh, hint, like we have 50% of our human genome is a duplication, is something repeated itself. So you cannot expect to have a single location match with the read. And uh, we need basically to tolerate small variation or uh, errors in each read. We call them errors because they might be sequencing errors, but if they are genetic differences, then we call them genetic variations. 
and this variation, what we are actually looking for, not the sequencing errors, because we want to know uh, what are the differences between my genome and your genome such that I have this disease, but you don't have it. This is normally the aim of this study, but not to find the sequencing errors. But because of, we have sequencing errors, so it will be confusing for us. We don't know whether this is coming really from something that causes a disease or just noise from the sequencing machine. Of course, sometimes we need to do this process very fast because it can be life-threatening situation in a hospital where we want to know what disease this patient has such that we can give him uh, an effective medication. Okay, one uh, brute force algorithm to do these steps is really to sequentially scan the reference genome. So we have the red segment here represent the reference genome and the blue segment represent a read. So you just sequentially, really sequentially scan it to the reference genome. And every time you check with the location, you, ch you check the similarity. Is it similar to this region? Is it similar to that region? It might be similar, but okay, how many differences between them? maybe 10 references, 10 differences. But then when I check another region, I find zero differences such that it exactly matched to that. Then I prefer the one with less differences because it's highly similar to that read. And I keep repeating this for all reads I have. This provides a very computational expensive method. Uh, think about very long reference genomes, such as the human, where we have 3.2 billion characters, and I need to compare with every single character, every single region at every single character, then it's really expensive to do. So what we do normally using some heuristics, some indexing um, methods, such as hash table that allow us to reduce the search space. You don't need to search in the entire reference, but you can search with a potential larger uh, space based on the hash table that tell me already in some hashed value that they are similar to this read. So I think you can find a lot of details about these steps and the learning materials that we assigned to you. And um, so even with the best thing that we are doing to accelerate read mapping, we are still very far from the sequencing machine. So in this, uh, in this figure, you can see that the best algorithm to do read mapping, it's 150 slower than the best uh, existing uh, sequencing machine. I think this slide I prepared um, two years or three years back, uh, but the numbers are still there. The ratio might get uh, increase and then decrease based on the processor that we have recently and then the sequencing machine uh, and that they provide recently and so on, but still we have a gap between the two technologies. So it's very important to accelerate the computational steps. There is nothing that we can do at the other side. Uh, it's only about chemical uh, reactions and such things inside the sequencing machines. But as a computer scientist or as electrical engineering uh, students or as any uh, researcher that study a field that's related to computational algorithms, such as bioinformatician, mathematicians, and so on, we can improve the algorithms here or the hardware accelerators to solve these issues, such that instead of taking a week to analyze your DNA, it might take few minutes or few seconds or few hours. That will be very helpful. So to accelerate the genome analysis steps, you need, of course, to know the bottlenecks. And without knowing the bottlenecks, there is no actually um, sense in uh, accelerating the entire thing. And when we were working on this problem, we figure out that 70 to 90% of all steps we are doing in read mapping is actually comparing a string to string. So if you find a very fast algorithm to accelerate string matching, then that will help you a lot to cut down the execution time by this much, which is 70 or 90% even in some cases. And when I tell you about the sequential scanning with the reference genome, it, even with using hash table, we still have a lot of location to be examined. And we, we find that 98% of these location that every time we check for a single read, they are highly dissimilar with the given read. 
So I'm comparing, for example, Switzerland to Netherlands, and then I compare India with Switzerland as a word, not as a country. So every time I keep uh, comparing these words together, I find that one of them is a good match and all the rest are highly dissimilar. There are a lot of differences, even if they, they have some matches with the characters, but still these matches are very less compared to, to the differences. And one of the widely used algorithm to compare strings is dynamic programming. And if you study algorithms before, you might already take dynamic programming uh, uh, lessons. So in dynamic programming, what we do is actually when we compute something, which is the different, this number represent the, um, the similarity between this segment and this segment. And this, for example, a cell here represent the similarity between this segment and this segment. So this number says something. And every time I compute this number, I go back to this cell, to this cell and that one. And then I compute this value based on these three values. So I don't need at each cell to go back and check the similarity between this segment and this entire segment at every time. What I do, I just rely on the pre-computed cells. That's how we call it dynamic programming. So every time I reuse the computation that I did before. That is very good because it helped me saving uh, computation a lot. I don't need to recompute the things every time because they are repeated. So when I, when I compute, for example, the similarity between this and this, it already include examining the similarity between the first character and this, and then the second character and this, third character and so on. So that include a lot of repeated steps. So using dynamic programming by itself, is, is very good, it's very useful, it's not harmful, but the problem with it is that, uh, yeah. So why I use dynamic programming? Again, as I mentioned, I need to enumerate all possible values between two words such that I can know the differences between them. And by the way here, the differences are not only substitutions such, as, such that I remove or I replace one character with another, but it could be I really delete one of the characters and, or I insert a new character. And this is actually how it is in genome analysis. In our genomes, there are some diseases that are caused by deletion or insertion in your genome. That's why I'm using dynamic programming. But the problem with dynamic programming, as I mentioned, is the data dependencies. So to calculate one cell, you need to wait until you compute all the previous cells and then you proceed. This limits the acceleration effort a lot. So you cannot do the things in parallel here. You need to compute the first cell, the second cell in order, then the third, then the fourth. That is a sequential, even if you have a parallel platform such as FPGA. You cannot do it in parallel. Of course, there are a lot of tricks, a lot of heuristics, a lot of approaches trying to address these problems in FPGA or GPUs and so on that we already survey in the uh, second uh, learning materials that we assigned to you. Um, in this example, does the, the, um, the function of similar, similarity just compare the letters in, independent of their order? Uh, so actually it's in order, it should be in order. It's not uh, independent of the orders. That's why we respect the order of computing the, the values in the table. Yeah, but like in the second, in the second row, mm -hmm. uh, when we add the S of Netherlands, uh -huh. it doesn't go up because we have an S. So it doesn't matter where the S is, it permutes it, it shifts it all the way around as well. That's, that's true, doesn't matter at the cell level. So when you compute the cell, you don't care about the location. We just compute it based on the previous computed cells. But when we go up all the way to complete the entire table, for example, here, so this is the solution. And the last cell in the, this table, which is this five, represent the solutions to how many differences between the two words. So going all the way to here, you start trimming, actually, laterally pruning uh, the table. So you see all of these represent very high differences and we don't consider them. They are pruned by nature. 
by going forward computing the table. So although the single cell might not represent useful information, but that's why we need to continue until the end, until we get the useful information here. So the S, yeah, that's true. You can go here. So comparing S with S is exact match. But since we have a lot of mismatches before, that affect the score we have here. Does that answer your question? Actually, what I was wondering is if we already have some matches, like half of it, and then we add another letter, does that letter have to be like at the right point to be allowed to be a good match, or could it be anywhere? Yeah, that's a good question. So that depends on what we call scoring function. So the scoring function decides what number I should assign when I have exact match. So it depends on the disease that you are looking for. Uh, we need to select different numbers how to fill this. For example, so this is about dynamic programming, but maybe I can explain it very fast. Um, for example, when you have here match with match, what number should I add here? Is it one, two, three, four? This is what we call scoring function. So the user is responsible for specifying the penalty, we call it, for a match and the penalty for insertion, the penalty for deletion. So if it is exact match and the previous one was an exact match, then uh, all of this will be accumulated in the cell itself. So when I calculate the 10 here, it is actually one of those plus the uh, match penalty. So you can see since this exact match in dynamic programming, if it is exact match, then I need to pick this value. And then I add the penalty for a match, which is here, I think it should be zero. That's why I got 10 here. So you can see another example also, for example, the E here, it's exact match with E here. So this is how we solve it in dynamic programming. So if, this, if both of them are exact match, I need to go uh, this cell. I need to check the value here and then add to it a penalty for a match, which is four. But uh, if we have inexact match, for example, I and T, I go to here or to here or to here and then add the uh, substitution or insertion penalty. That's why you can see here it's three. It might be two plus one from here or three plus zero, it depends on the scoring function you have. But if you are really interested in finding the exact matches in the same location, then normally we use a zero for a match and negative penalty for the insertion and deletion. So I'm not sure if I answer your question, um, it's very hard to tell you these details without knowing what is scoring function. But yes, you are right. When we compare gen genomic sequence with another genomic sequence, what are we are interested in is finding the pairwise matches. So we don't care if the S appears very far from the, uh, we, not we don't care, sorry, but we don't get useful information if the S is very far from the corresponding S. It should be pairwise. It should So when we have a similarity, this sequence and this is another sequence, so I expect these regions to be exactly here in the same location, and this region to be exactly in here. It's okay to have some differences in between because these are the genetic differences that I'm looking for. But I cannot have this region, for example, here, or uh, a character here, very far from here. That doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't provide any useful information, actually. Unless it's a big region that is swapped to somewhere else, that we call it alteration or structure variation. OK, thanks. Yeah. So again, going back to the dynamic programming table, since we have data dependencies between the cells, then we cannot accelerate the things unless we use some heuristics. And um, as, as you ask for this question about uh, filling the table, then yeah, it's very important to fill the entire table. So this, we call it a lot of waste uh, for the resources and for the, um, the memory utilization and execution time. 
Why is that? Because think about two really highly dissimilar sequences, and then we compute the entire table for them, and we figure out at the end that they are highly dissimilar, having 100 differences between them. So this is useless. We already compute the entire table, but then we don't use it. This, these challenges um, uh, are also magnified by the fact that we are not looking for single difference. So think about here, every line here represents a single individual uh, the, or the, the genome of that individual. And we are trying to compare all these DNAs together to figure out which region is responsible for this disease, which is a blood pressure here. So we already get the DNA sequences somehow. And then when we compare them using our algorithm, we find two differences between them, which we call SNP1 and SNP2. SNP is a single nucleotide polymorphism or single uh, difference in the genome. So as smart people, as all of you, then you start thinking whether SNP1 or SNP2 is correlated with high blood pressure. So what do you think? Which one is really correlated with high blood pressure, for example? Any thoughts, any idea? I think there's no way to tell because you could rearrange the samples and then it would look completely different. No, but these numbers are uh, for that individual. So we, ah, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so this line, uh, we get the genome for him or for that individual, and then we measure the blood pressure. We find it this much, and we keep doing the same thing for these individuals. What do you think now? That would be SMP one. No. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. So if you look at SNAP2, for example, you have A at 100 and then A at 110 and A even at 175. So it's really random. It doesn't make any sense. There is no correlation. But if you look at SNAP1, we got a very nice um, a correlation here. Whenever it's T at that region, then that individual doesn't suffer from high blood pressure, for example. But when we get to C, then that individual probably um, has a high blood pressure. It's not necessarily to have it. It might, uh, his kids, for example, or her kids will have this disease in the future or maybe other generation, but that can tell something. If you have it, we check the blood pressure. If you really have high blood pressure, then you suffer from that disease and um, a, a medication is required for this case. Not all the disease have this very nice single variation that easily to be discovered. For example, in these complex disease, autism and obesity, for example, we have alteration of 600,000 characters in your genome. For example, if you delete this amount, 600,000 characters from chromosome 16, then you will suffer from obesity. However, if you duplicate this amount, the same amount, and the same chromosome, then you will get totally opposite disease, which is underweight. And the same thing with autism. So it's very challenging to discover this variation between genomes. So you're not looking for a single difference that you just easily compare pairwise using X or operation or something like that. But even you need to consider large amount of deletion or insertion. That's why we are using dynamic programming because consider all permutations between two strings. Here are the references if you are interested more to knowing about this disease, you can check all of these. It's very interesting to see the opposite disease caused by opposite alteration in your genome. All right, so this is another use case showing the importance of genome analysis or the challenges you have with genome analysis. Think about city scale microbiome studies. What we mean by city scale microbiome is when you go to anything related to the environment, in air, cities, um, train stations, universities where it's very crowded. So you expect to see a lot of microbiomes from viruses, bacteria. And this is true with COVID-19, what we are doing these days actually. And uh, there's a study in New York where they swap all subway stations uh, with 
1,500 samples and then try to analyze them and see if there is something dangerous that might affect the people there. However, this study was uh, conducted by very good tools, by very good institute, very good researchers, but they get traces of plague. And this plague is life-threatening, so it might cause death and already uh, caused death in the previous centuries. So it's very dangerous to find something in New York subway, which is a very crowded place. And that dragged a lot of attention in the media and uh, how come you can find this um, life-threatening things in the New York subway station. But when we uh, use a traditional or conventional way of doing genome analysis in the wet lab, where they can uh, grow the sample in, 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 in the wet lab, then they can find whether, or they can really get the traces of um, this plague or it was something else. And actually they didn't find um, that uh, bacteria in the, the, the New York uh, station. And they consider it as a false positive. So from that time, people start um, 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 saying that bioinformatics uh, is, um, or they call this, this actually, this case as a failure of bioinformatics. So they said, okay, we keep saying algorithm might help. We don't need to use um, conventional methods in wet lab and wait days. Algorithms can do a very great job and CPUs can process them in a much faster than human does in uh, wet lab and so on. But now we get false positive that uh, I say in this sample there's coronavirus, but there was nothing there. So that show you uh, the, the, the need or the critical need, not only for fast genome analysis, but also for accurate one. So your goal is to not ruin the algorithmic behavior of genome analysis to gain speed. That will uh, cause a lot of false positive. It's okay to use heuristics. I'm not against that, but you need to really know the trade-off between the heuristics in terms of accuracy and speed. It's okay to sacrifice a little bit of accuracy depending on the application. So if your goal is not to study, for example, if you have a, a, a serious disease or serious uh, microbiome or something else, it's really different than having the goal of studying the differences for eye color. Then you really don't need um, um, very uh, computationally expensive algorithm to do that for you because we know that the eye color is caused by less amount of variation in the DNA rather than the uh, totally different uh, genomes coming from viruses or bacteria. So it depends on the application. You can tweak the parameter or the algorithm that you are using to accelerate genome analysis. And still, there are a lot of open questions, such as how we can enable fast, accurate, and also cheap, because we mentioned you need to pay some money for this genome analysis. So it doesn't make sense if you do it on a daily basis before your flight that you need to test for coronavirus, you pay $1,000 every time. This doesn't make sense. And we need to respect the privacy of the individuals or the subjects that we are studying. Because once you get the genome of that individual, you're already revealing too much about him, about her, about the family, about their kids, and so on. And you need to do this sometimes at scale, especially in this pandemic time, where you might need to analyze the DNA before every flight, before entering the school, before traveling from country to country. And that's a huge population traveling from one place to another. So you need to do it in a very fast way such that you can make the travel uh, an efficient one. So in traditional computer, what we have, we have the three separated modules or units that uh, uh, all um, compose the computer. So we have the processor or the CPU and then the main memory and then the storage. However, the sequencing machine is totally separate unit, such that you need to move the data from the sequencer to the storage all the way to main memory, then different level of caches all the way to the CPU. And it's very interesting to know that single memory request consumes up to 800x more energy compared to performing a complex add operation. So just moving the data from memory to CPU, you are consuming much energy than the computation itself. So how about moving the data from here to there to there 
all the way to the CPU and then backward. So all this back and forth data movement is very expensive. That's why in this course, we are trying to aim to find accelerators where we can process the things much faster near where the data resides. So if we're generating the data inside the sequencer, it doesn't make sense to move it all the way to all these different levels of uh, compute stacks. We can have some computation units such as FPGA cards. Any questions? Okay, so we need to have some accelerators, some specialized or customized accelerator inside the sequencing machine, for example, or inside the main memory or next to the CPU, such as doing a, a customized job more efficient than the CPU, for example. So that's what we'll try to investigate in this course with different projects for different steps. What are the uh, energy efficiency that we gain or the speed that we save, or maybe the cost that we save by processing uh, these uh, steps of genome analysis next to the sequencing machine or next to different uh, units of the compute stack. So the key takeaway of this uh, brief introduction to genome analysis is that most speed up comes from parallelism. Of course, if you want to accelerate something, you need to impose parallelism to the algorithm and the architecture. So it's very important to consider both of them when you want to build something efficient. You cannot take the algorithm as it is and try to fit it to GPU, but you need to do some tweaks to the algorithm. You may need to change it with something else, have an heuristic that it is perfectly designed for novel architecture, or if you know the FPGA has a bitwise operation, so it's very uh, good to find an algorithm that support uh, bitwise operation such that you can leverage the full power of the architecture. And this is very important to understand uh, to get a good progress in uh, these projects. Of course, not all the projects that we provide has, uh, have the same level of complexity or the uh, architecture efforts required for designing. Some of them focus a little bit more on the algorithm side. Some of them focus on the architecture uh, level. So we will discuss them in next week and uh, we will see what kind of projects we can assign to each one of you. But I can assure you that uh, this semester will be so much fun and so much interesting just uh, knowing um, how you can use the skills that you already gain in computer architecture course in something uh, beneficial for the life. So do you have any questions about the logistics or the genome analysis in general? Any questions, Nicholas? Why why do we know in when we analyze the genome that the errors or differences are very small, so that there aren't a million characters wrong? Sorry, is this the question about the read or the genome? About the genome. Is it why? You're asking why we know that there are small differences between genomes? Yes, and only small differences. So why do we know that why why do we know that we that it is safe to compare the differences that there are so less uh, so few differences? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, um, it depends on the application. Normally, we have an application in mind before we do any genome analysis uh, steps here. So if we are considering a disease that we already studied before, then we know already where it exists, in which chromosome, in which region in that chromosome that affect. So we don't really need to compare the entire genome to the entire genome to, get, uh, to gain more insights about this disease. But in some other disease that we don't really know, such as cancer and autism, cancer is well known that all these uh, variations are totally random or totally shifted from one cancer type to another cancer type. So autism, same thing. If you analyze the DNA, you might find differences. But when you go to another individual with autism and compare it again, you will see totally different location for the differences. So in that case, uh, we do uh, larger studies that involve thousands of individuals rather than few uh, samples. 
and we call these studies GWAS. So it's a genome-wide association study. And with that, we consider a population of a city, for example, like 10,000 people. And then we compare all these genomes together. Again, comparing here is not a small number of variations. We try to cluster this variation and say, okay, we find that 50% of these people might have the variation in this location, and other 50 might have it in totally different location. And this is still beneficial, even if we don't find single variation. Why is that? Because we go to a totally different level, which we call personalized medicine. So in personalized medicine, we designed the medication to be tailored for that cluster. These people will be uh, benef will gain benefits from this medication, but other people, although they might have the same symptoms or the same disease, but they might not get benefits from the same medication. That's why it's important to know the genetic differences, even if we don't know a single difference, but it's okay to cluster them and then try to design the medication for these clusters. So every cluster you will have totally different medication. That's why in some critically sick people, um, we need to analyze their DNA first because it's very harmful to try different medication on the same uh, patient and they might not get benefits in the early days. So their situation might get complicated, stay more in the hospital and so on. So what they do normally is they analyze their genome first in a very fast way, very fast time. Then they said, okay, you belong to this cluster. We will try with this medication first. Then with that medication second and so on. This is how they put the plan for these things. Okay. But there are a lot of things that we don't know still, even if we can compare genomes together, there are things more complex than this because you might have the differences, but they are not, they might not be correlated to the disease. They might just be noise. Uh, so some people called these regions as junk DNA, but I'm against this name because these are the things that we don't know. They are not trash. They have functionality, but we don't know yet what their functionality is. So you might have differences in these regions but still it might not be correlated to any disease. Okay, yes, thank you. Yeah. All right, so I think we are done for today. We will meet uh, hopefully next week. We will decide on the time and see the list of the projects. Hopefully it will be interesting to everyone. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.